Is your magic meter running low? Well, we've got a cure for you. Welcome to Disney Coast to Coast. Hey folks, and welcome to Disney Coast to Coast, the ultimate unofficial Disney fan podcast. I'm Jeff DePauly, and today on the show I have my good friend Aaron Wallace here, who is the author of The Thinking Fan's Guide to... Eh, eventually everything disney so far magic kingdom <laughs> epcot and hocus pocus how's it going aaron uh it's great i'm doing well jeff uh thanks for having me back it's great to be here how are you doing I, i'm good i'm good uh i i'm having you back because this is kind of an unscheduled unplanned thing of course you're always welcome on the show but you sent out a tweet recently that yeah. sort of blew my mind when i saw this um i am going to warn listeners right now I will be poking, I, I guess warning you as well, I will be poking <laughs> lots of fun at my yeah, dear... Yeah, I'm the one who needs the warning. What was that? I'm the one who needs the warning. That's right. I I, I mean, I think you knew what you were going to get when you sent out this tweet, but the it's, it's so crazy to me what you tweeted, and it's essentially, uh, before you lived in Orlando, when you planned your Walt Disney World vacations, your schedules were down to the minute. And you essentially uh, tweeted one of these spreadsheets, and we're going to have a conversation about it today. Not only about like what I think is the absurdity of it, but also the <laughs> the pros of it, the the cons of it, and and you know how your system has changed through the years. So let's get into that conversation right now. It's time to dive into today's Disney dialogue. Okay, Aaron. So before we get going here, what what was the purpose of that tweet? Okay, well, it's funny you said that I knew what I was getting into, but honestly, I almost didn't even tweet it. I was uh, so I'm moving into a new place, and so I'm just sort of going through my old folders. I came across some of these old trip itineraries, of which there are many. I mean, dozens of these made for different trips. I just and love I that thought, you have, still have them printed out. I feel like in this day and age, most people are like, "Oh, this paper is clutter. Scan it, keep it in a file if I want it for posterity." But you know, so you um, still. Disney- my Disney trip souvenirs are, are too precious to to trash. So no, there are there are giant folders full of these things. And I thought, you know, this is like super specific and old and no one's going to care. But I thought, well, it makes me laugh. So I tweeted it out and I was so surprised by the response. Like so many people responded to that. And I just would not have thought that people cared. But it is funny to look back at uh, not only what the parks were like years ago in the pre Fast Pass Plus era, but also what I was like as a younger hardcore Disney fan who was not a Disney local at the time. And now, of course, I live just right outside of Walt Disney World. Uh, but, but yeah, f- fun times and, and crazy fandom. Yeah, so these spreadsheets, you sent me just one of them, and it's one that you did during the Happiest Celebration on Earth, which would have been 2005. And I, I believe this is not the one that you tweeted. You also sent me that one, but the one that we're mostly going to be discussing today uh, was this 2005 trip. And yeah, it was actually early early 2006, spring 2006, so the happiest celebration on Earth was still going on. Because, yeah. of course, celebrations are 18 months. At Walt <laughs> they Disney. never end. So, yeah, so, yeah, so I'm, we're going to go through this. Some questions may come up along the way. I definitely have some questions for you at the end. But uh, first page, and by the way, how many pages is this? Let me, let me ruffle through and count. One, two, three, four, five, six... And I could count the last page, seven. It's just a picture of Cinderella Castle and some fireworks. But, uh, yeah, seven seven pages. for Yeah, seven pages for a one-day trip. <laughs> Unbelievable. <laughs> All right. So, uh, page one. At the top, we have Roy O. Disney's opening day speech for Walt Disney World. Uh, would you like to read it, or we can just skip past that if you I, want? I think you've covered the opening day speeches in, in exactly. some detail on this show. Go back to old episodes if you want to hear that. But... I do want to read this opening paragraph. Uh, would you like me to read it or would you like to? Yeah, you go for it, Jeff. Okay. Uh, th- I love this. <laughs> I'm already laughing. We haven't even started. Uh, the purpose of the Walt Disney World agenda is to alleviate the headaches of confusion, indecision, and argument while inside the park. <laughs> I love that first sentence because... The first thing I I thought when I saw this was like, oh my God, I would get into such a fight with the person that created this. Uh, Yeah. Because I'd be like, this is not uh, conducive to fun. But in any case, 
Time for flex- okay. We're going to talk about that. But we go will ahead. certainly talk about that. Time for flexibility is built into each stop on the schedule, so that staying ahead should be possible. Nothing is rigid, as the schedule is meant to enhance enjoyment and enable spontaneity. <laughs> the schedule is, however, designed with numerous factors kept in mind and should serve as a useful guide for where to be at what time, if possible, to avoid lines and do as much as possible while still taking in the magic. Our mission: the impossible. The Walt Disney World Resort, in its entirety, twice the size of Manhattan, and one 16-hour day. We can do it. We must be mindful of our time. Keep in mind, Expedition Everest is not yet officially open, so while it should be operating, it may open or close at any time, and Pirates of the Caribbean may be closed as well. And if we have time to catch Fantasmic, well, that would be cool. (laughs) <laughs> We're visiting during the happiest celebration on Earth, in which Walt Disney World and all of its sister resorts are celebrating Disneyland's 50th anniversary. The parks are decked out accordingly. Woo! Okay. Okay, that's embarrassing. Uh, a few... <laughs> <laughs> Which part particularly? <laughs> a little bit of all of it, but a, a few a few prefaces here. Okay, first, I'm a very different person today. I was, what, 19, 20 years old when we put this together. I'm what was the group size now. when you were putting this together? Uh, I think there were eight people on this trip. Okay. So this is the other preface, I guess. So I, this was my college years. I was very fortunate to have a group of eight friends. We were like family. We did everything together. And of the eight of us, only two were sort of hardcore Disney fans. But... Nevertheless, going to Walt Disney World sort of became our thing as a group. Uh, the rest were just sort of along for the ride. Uh, and we all got annual passes. And so there were many times during college we would get out of class Friday at 11 a.m. And just on the spur of a moment say, hey, do you want to get in the car and drive to Florida? And we would. Where, where were um, you again? North Carolina. North Carolina. Yeah, okay. so, so it was about a 10-hour t- drive. Uh, but we would do that with some frequency. But more often than that, we would have these elaborately pre-planned trips uh, in which there were not only seven page schedules for one day, but there were leading up to that trip planning meetings and PowerPoint presentations. Uh, But here's the thing, Jeff, it was part of the fun, like the anticipation that built during these planning sessions and just the process of putting together a schedule itself contributed so much to the overall vacation experience, even months in advance. I was thinking that as I was reading this, it's funny, I showed this to somebody, uh, a friend of mine. And she said, she's like, wow, that's somebody with a lot of free time. And I was like, well, he was younger. And and now that you say it was college years, that makes total sense. And yes, I did think to myself, I was like, listen, this kind of schedule isn't for everybody. And frankly, like, I consider myself an extremely organized person. Some people even call me obsessive compulsive. But I this I would never do to this level because this would not be fun for me but as i was saying it has to be fun for you to do this insane schedule otherwise it's just complete misery so you're you're right the powerpoints and the stuff whatever you guys did obviously this was part of your enjoyment and i'm a person that loves anticipation like i'm the type of guy that people are like oh i'm so bummed d23 expos every two years instead of every year i'm like i love it because i'm like savoring it uh, for an entire two years waiting for the next one so i i get what you're saying completely yeah and i will say would i create this kind of itinerary today in 2018 absolutely not would i want to follow it no but even if you weren't local well I don't know, and everything, we'll get into this, but everything has changed so much with FastPass Plus now. But I, I will say, as, as, you know, again, as college students traveling on a budget, I mean, we wanted to squeeze every minute out of Walt Disney World that we could. We wanted to see as much as we could. And, and experiencing all four parks in one day is no small feat. No. Uh, but it's the only thing we had the budget for on this particular trip, as I recall. So, Everyone was on board. I mean, as, as exhausting as this idea seems of a minute by minute schedule, Everyone was on board with the idea of they didn't want to make the schedule, but it's like, hey, if you make it for us and we can just sort of be on autopilot once we're in the park and end the day by seeing everything, everyone was was on board. And that's important. I mean, you wouldn't want to force this kind of schedule on someone. Yeah. But if everybody's game for it, then yeah. Okay. I do have the question, but don't answer it yet. Just keep in mind, at the end, I'm going to ask, was your mission su- successful? So okay. hold, hold on to that and don't let me forget okay. to ask it at the end. But uh, starting at the top, first of all, I, I do want to say this is the schedule is covered in graphics from <laughs> whenever the name of a park is mentioned. It's not just typed out. It's, it's using the font and graphic of that park. So 
Uh, and just in case you weren't sure what Expedition Everest looked like, there's a picture there to show you. So when you're in the park, oh, we're walking toward that mountain that Aaron <laughs> has so kindly pictured here for us. So and anyway, at the top, the key says, stay ahead of schedule, not just on schedule, or certainly not behind. Be flexible, hurry, but appreciate. <laughs> is that a you thing or is that a be flexible, hurry, but appreciate? I don't, is that like a common saying? No, I don't think it's a common saying. I think that, that was that was my way of sending two messages at the same time. I love it. I love it. Why don't you start with day one? What does day one say? All right. So day one is entitled Getting There and Being There. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, it, it just starts with arriving uh, at Walt Disney World at 5.30 p.m. and making a beeline to not Disney Springs, but downtown Disney, as it was known at the time. Uh, and uh, we, I guess, just ate dinner there and then headed over to... Port Orleans Riverside at 11 p.m. Uh, to see Bob Jackson, the piano guy, do his show, which was a staple of all of our trip. Whom I still have never seen. Oh, Jeff, when you come down, we've got to make that a priority. Okay, my schedule's pretty full. You know what I've discovered yeah. by – I'm planning a Walt Disney World vacation right now, but I've discovered I'm a nighttime spectacular guy because this trip – I have like a full week, but I don't have time to do all the nighttime events, especially because there's so many Halloween events going on. Like, I have three nights – taken by Halloween with the um, Sleepy Hollow thing, plus Mickey's Not So Scary, plus Halloween Horror Nights. I'm like, I'm booked. But in any case, yes. I get that. But here's the thing. If his show ends, which he's, he's getting up there, he's been doing this thing for a long, long time. If his show ends and you didn't see it, yeah, you'll probably really regret it. I think he is on the order of, uh, what's his name, Billy Hill? Uh, oh, Billy Hill and the Land. Hillbillies? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think this guy is on his way to you know someday Disney legend status for having been as, well, as an individual, a part of so many guests' Walt Disney World vacations over the course of decades. What hours does he perform? I think he's, he starts around maybe 10 or 11 p.m. and oh, okay. goes for oh, a few hours a late into the night. night. Thing. Okay. Yeah, it's a late night thing. Okay, cool. Okay, so uh, you're at downtown Disney, go see Bob Jackson, and then at 12 a.m., back home, sleep. Until day two, which is four parks, one world. And this starts, so you went to bed at midnight, and... When do you start the next morning? 7.25 a.m. Ooh, this is this is definitely <laughs> the college years. Oh, yeah. And this is two two hotel rooms at an all-star resort with four people packed into each. So in between midnight and 7.25 a.m., you know, there are showers and waiting for other people to shower and all that. So, so not a lot of sleep. Yeah. So I love this 7.25 a.m. leave all-star movies and resort for... 7.40 a.m. arrive at Disney's Animal Kingdom. So I am curious, like, how, at, where did you get that amount of time it would take? Because that seems like a short amount of time to get to Disney's Animal Kingdom from where you were. I mean, that's, that's it kind of seems like one of those, if nothing goes wrong, we will arrive at Oh, Disney. yeah. And that was definitely the spirit of of this of these schedules in general. It was an optimistic, ambitious spirit. Uh, I think when I started putting them together, I was using the unofficial guide to Walt Disney World, where they have uh, a lot of uh, estimated times for how long it'll take you to experience each traction, as well as to travel from one point to the next. And then over time, I started timing things for myself and, and using those as I went along. But yeah, they are ambitious, optimistic, fingers crossed that nothing goes wrong time periods, and assuming that everyone's kind of moving at a brisk pace. Okay, so then uh, why don't you continue? Okay, so we begin at the Oasis, 7.45 a.m. for the Circle of Life opening ceremony uh, and just getting in position to make a beeline into Asia and sort of seeing the Tree of Life along the way. You know, that is something, This the Oasis morning opening, the little opening moment that they do. Does that still practice. happen? I'm actually not sure. I was about to say I haven't even endeavored to see that in years now. Uh, I think I think something still happens, but I, I should know, and I don't. I was there before park opening, but it was to wait in line for Pandora. So if something did happen, I didn't see mm. it near the Tree of Life. So I'm not sure. Well, this would happen in the Oasis before oh, okay. you get to the Tree of Life. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Then I don't. I don't know. I have no idea if that happens or not. So okay. So that happens at 7:45. Then at 8 a.m., the park officially opens, and you book rope drop, it, book it towards Asia. Well, we had to because. 8 or 5 a.m. Expedition Everest, as you mentioned earlier, wasn't open yet. It was in soft opening. It had been in soft opening for a few weeks. I think this trip was maybe a week or two before its official grand opening. Okay. And the hope was that we could all get in for our first ever pre-opening ride. Did you? We, did. you we did. did. We got in. Yes. Did you get from rope drop 
to Asia in five minutes? <laughs> I couldn't tell you if it happened in exactly five, but I will tell you that we were we were hustling. Okay. So you gave yourself 25 minutes at Expedition Everest and then at 8.30 a.m., which is kind of amazing that you gave yourself that little time considering, I guess, if you're first. <laughs> but, I mean, it was an unopened attraction. Obviously, everybody was booking it toward that attraction. No, I remember – I remember. so when we showed up, they weren't open – they weren't landing anyone yet, and there weren't many guests around there at all. And they, a cast member said, if you hang around a few minutes, we'll let you in. So I think we, we stood outside for like three or four minutes, and they waved us in, and there was no one else around. So we went in and rode and uh, – uh, every effect was working. What a glorious time in Expedition Everest history. <laughs> they, uh, the, the people working must have known about your schedule. So they're like, just, <laughs> just a few minutes. Don't worry. Yeah, I was Mr. like, uh, we have somewhere to be at 8.30 a.m. So. Exactly. 8.30 a.m. you go to Kali River Rapids. Doesn't open until 8.30, and, which is weird. Why doesn't that open until 8.30? Like, is that a, a regular thing still? Yeah, I think it does open later. You know, it's a, it's a water ride. I guess people don't want to ride... Uh, don't want to get soaking wet first thing in the morning. Those 30 minutes make a big difference. Uh, <laughs> use use Fast Pass only if necessary. And then so Cali River Rapids at 8.30, Dinoland USA at 8.45 a.m. for Dinosaur. Fast Pass only if necessary. Yeah, and that turns up a lot. So I, I remember the golden rule being if the standby is 25 minutes or maybe even 30, then you opt for the standby. Uh, and if it's longer than that, then you use Fast Pass. Okay. And then, okay, so this is where it cracks, like, this is where it really cracks me up. So you said 8.45 a.m. Dinosaur, 9.03 a.m. Primeval Whirl, Fast Pass Only if Necessary. Okay, where did 9.03 come from? Hey, you don't get through four parks by rounding up and down, Jeff. (laughs) (laughs) But but what made you think, okay, it's going to take 18 minutes, Dinosaur, to... Did you like have the length of the attraction in mind, or I'm very curious where the 903 came from? Yeah, I had the length of attraction, and if I recall, I I had a standard amount of time that I would build in for like, walking through queues and that sort of thing. Okay, yeah. uh, please read your next 9:22 a.m. I love this little <laughs> side note. Flex time, shop, sightsee, sight is misspelled, character meeting, autographs, or make up for lost time, and if time allows. Visit It's Tough to Be a Bug inside the Tree of Life. Do you happen to remember whether or not you got to It's it's Tough to Be a Bug? I don't think we did. So flex time appears in every land, usually within these schedules. And the idea is mostly it's a buffer for if we would be running behind. And often we were bathroom breaks, all that sort of thing. And so that time usually got absorbed between those two things. So I don't think we made it to It's Tough to Be a Bug. Okay. So then uh, this next line... Oh, it hurts my heart ever so slightly, even just reading mm. it. 9.32 a.m., exit park, head to Disney MGM Studios. Oh, yeah. oh yeah. rest in peace. Okay, so from 9.32 a.m., sorry, were you going to say something? Well, I was going to say, you know, so as ridiculous as the schedule may seem, it is 9.45 a.m. We have already experienced, what, six Six attractions, well, like three attractions, six experiences in the park, and we are now heading to our second park of the day, 9.45 a.m. You know what's so interesting to me about this is, having known you for several years now, this is so the opposite of an Aaron (laughs) Wallace uh, Disney Parks appreciation that I've come to know. This is a, we're doing the rides and we're doing as many of them as possible, which I think is very much a non-locals thoughts when it comes to the Disney Parks. And I get that. You're paying a lot of money. You want to do the big stuff. But knowing you, it's just so interesting just because you're like, no, take a moment, appreciate those tiny, small things. In fact, I'll write a book about it. And, uh, and like, this doesn't keep any of that in mind, it feels like. I'm sure you appreciate the little things along the way, but it's not, sure. but it's not conducive to that. Sure. And I mean, you know, as, as a group, we had already all taken trips to Walt Disney World before. So it wasn't that, you know, first time silk it all in. But I will say, uh, that what you're witnessing in part here is an evolution of personality because yeah, this is not how I would, I would do the parks now. Uh, but part of it's the local thing too, for sure. I think inherently anyone who lives as you do, you know, even within an hour 
of a Disney theme park, you just your entire experience of those parks is fundamentally different than yeah. someone who has to travel a long way. Very much so. So 9.32 a.m., you exit Animal Kingdom. Uh, 9.45 a.m., you enter Disney MGM Studios. I'd be curious if that was successful or not. Um, and then you say, see the Sorcerer's Hat, which, let me think, this was 2005, so that had been there for four years at that point. Was this your first time seeing the Sorcerer's Hat, or why was that such no. a note on your... So every time we enter a park on any of these trip itineraries, there's always a note that says, see, insert park icon here. And the reason for that is in my earliest schedules, I used to have a note that said, you will want to stop and take photos, but now is not the optimal time for taking photos. So let's just walk by quickly and come back and take pictures later because you don't want to waste those precious morning rope drop hours on taking pictures. And so I got it. I, I did away with that note. And instead it just says, see the sorcerer's hat. So you've got what, 10 minutes built in here to kind of stop and grab a quick photo because I realized that people wanted to do that no matter what. Interesting. Okay. So then at 9.55 a.m., you're going to get the Tower of Terror Fast Pass and then Sunset Boulevard. 9.58 a.m., because I'll give you that, the Tower of Terror Fast Pass is about three minutes away from the Rock and Roller See? Coaster. See? And here's the thing, though. It doesn't say Ride the Ride. It says Rock and Roller Coaster starring, Aeros- starring Aerosmith Visit Gift Shop. So did you ride it? Yeah, I think the idea here was to ride it and then see the gift shop on the way out. The reason that note there is there is because I love that gift shop. So I always want to spend a little bit of time there. Okay, interesting. So then why don't you continue? All right, so 1038, right after the Rock and Roller Coaster gift shop, we are riding Tower of Terror uh, at either 1038 or when Fast Pass becomes available, because that's the thing. Back in those days, you didn't know when your Fast Pass uh, would be available in advance. You got your return time when you got your ticket on the day of. Uh, and so you always had to leave some wiggle room for accommodating the Fast Pass schedule. Cool. And then you went to Hollywood Boulevard or. Uh, and yeah, then... an- another heartbreak moment here, oh, Jeff. Oh, goodness. At 1053 a.m. The great movie ride. Yeah, I, I, I legitimately will never get over that. And honestly, what breaks Same. my heart even more about that is reading. I probably read this in the last year or two. May have been longer, but they were sup- go- they were gonna build a great movie ride right here where I live in downtown Burbank, California. And did you never hear this? No. They were Disney was going to Disney was gonna basically what is downtown Burbank, California. Disney was going to build essentially a downtown Disney and they not associated with a theme park or anything. It was just going to be like a downtown Disney shopping area, which is what downtown Burbank is. It's like a mall and a lot of places Mm -hmm. to eat and shop and stuff. And so Disney was going to build one. And as part of it, they were going to have like a separate admission, great movie ride. And all I think to myself is, oh my goodness, it would make that blow a lot easier of it leaving Disney's Hollywood studios if I had one down the street here, I, I would right. like that. You know, that's a good point. As as Disney fans, we often lament the uh, duplicating of attractions mm-hmm. from one resort to another. However, it does at least give you the equivalent, the theme park equivalent of a file backup. Well, <laughs> yeah, exactly. For me, honestly, I was, I was really sad to see it's tough to be a bug close at Disney California Adventure. But I keep saying to myself, well, at least it's at Disney's Animal Kingdom, which honestly, I don't think I've done at Disney's Animal Kingdom since my first visit back in 1998, because I'm always like, oh, it's a DCA. I don't need to do it here. So I'm happy that I can at least visit it there. I, I love that attraction. I think it's great. Yeah, I mean, same thing, you know, Mr. Toad's Wild Ride, as as upset as people were about it leaving Magic Kingdom, it still exists in the world. That's what really matters, as long as you can get to it. The real tragedy is when there's only one of a really special, fantastic attraction, like The Great Movie Ride, and when it's gone, it's gone, and it's never coming back. Yeah, very sad. So, t- uh, The Great Movie Ride was 10.53 a.m., then at 11.24 a.m., you're going to head towards uh, Echo Lake in Star Tours, Fast Pass, only if necessary and available. Visit Tatooine Traders on the way out. There's a theme here. You like gift shops. I do like gift shops, and these days, that's probably where I spend... Uh- <laughs> <laughs> I will say the bulk, but maybe half my time in the theme parks. I love keeping up with Disney merchandise. I kind of geek out about it. It's so funny because it. as a local, I find myself not wanting much from the parks because yeah, no. I'm I'm always just like, yeah, I like this is terrible to say, but I'm like, I kind of have what I want. Every once in a while, something really special will come out and be like, oh, I must have it. But I don't know. I don't spend much time in gift shops. 
Yeah, well, and who has time to, to or who has space to store uh, to store all that merch? I never buy anything, but I just I more like study the merchandise as as an indicator of where Disney's um, creative direction is going or where their heads are at, you know? And that is the next book from Aaron Wallace, The Thinking Fan's Guide (laughs) to Walt Disney World Gift Shops. Gift Shops, yeah. But this was Star Tours 1.0, which I love 2.0, but I'm already a little nostalgic for 1.0. Yeah, I, I... You know, I heard... I don't know if this ever happened or not, but I heard... Remember those Star Wars nights happening at Disneyland? Yeah. I heard that they were gonna they were gonna bring back like for nostalgia's sake the original film. And, okay. But I don't know if they did that or not, to be honest. But that would be cool. That's the kind of value adding thing they need to do at these special events. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So then at eleven forty eight AM you're having lunch and then heading to the streets of America for I'm glad this is on the list. Jim Henson's Muppet Vision three D. Visits oh, always on the list. Yeah. Visit stage one company store on the way out. And then <laughs> another gift shop. Yeah, exactly. And then 1240, walk through big city streets of America, which sadly, once again, no longer there. But most importantly, you didn't miss something very important from your schedule. Why don't you go on reading? 1243. This is just for Jeff DePauly years before I even knew you. Honey, I Shrunk the Kids movie set adventure. I don't like this little side note. (laughs) Try to limit time here. What is that? (laughs) No, you should read that as a compliment, because what that's saying is, the Honey, I Shrunk the Kids movie set adventure is so wonderful. You will want to spend hours there, but we can't. So I accept. resist the urge. I, that's, that's very good. I like that. So Side note, Big City Streets of America. I forgot that it was formally called that at one point, because when it closed, it was just Streets of America. Streets of America. Yeah, I don't remember it's, that name ever. And I think it, when it first opened, was it called New York Street? I think so. It's, it's gone through several name changes. Big City Streets of America was before they built the San Francisco Street add-on. Okay. And I think it then became Streets of America after that. Okay. Then you head to Mickey Avenue at 12.55 p.m. to go to Journey into Narnia. You could have taken that off the list. <laughs> no. Are, are you talking about – this was the original – Narnia with the White Witch before the Prince Caspian attraction, which I think maybe stuck around longer. When you say with the White Witch, was that like when the actress was up and she just stood still and you're like, is that a mannequin or is that a human? (laughs) Okay, I loved it, but that might also be because I was 20 years old uh, and very into Narnia at the time. You know what I liked that a lot of people don't, but I thought it was quite unique, was actually the thing that replaced that, the Pirates of the Caribbean one with with Jack Sparrow. That was in that same space, wasn't it? Yes, it was in the same space. I'm surprised that you liked that. I liked it because I was impressed by the technology. Yes. As a showcase of technology, it was something to see. And as, as a temporary attraction. Like, I, I went sure. in knowing this wasn't anything permanent. If that was, like, a permanent attraction, I would have been like, what are you doing? But it's a marketing tool. And I thought that the the tech was really – there were definitely moments where I was like, wait a second, is that a human or is that a projection? Yeah, yeah, same here. I mean, they had me when Johnny Depp appeared to walk out in front of us. They lost me when a talking skull asked me to start stomping my feet with the crowd. Fair enough. Fair enough. And then after Journey into Narnia, so that was 12.55 p.m., then 1.13 p.m., Animation Courtyard, Voyage of the Little Mermaid. I love that you have that in there. That's still a must-see for me. I love it. You know, as dated as that show is, I feel it doesn't get enough appreciation. Yeah. You know, that, that's one of those ones that once it closes, I'm going to be bummed because there's no other. Like, that's, yeah. that's nowhere else. Okay, if you had to kill one of two shows at... Disney's Hollywood Studios, either The Voyage of the Little Mermaid or Beauty and the Beast live on stage. Beauty and the Beast, dead. Yeah, same. Hands down. No question. That, Easy question, I guess. That's a show that's dated that is severely dated. Whereas, like, Voyage of the Little Mermaid has gotten to a point of nostalgia. Like, it's so sure. dated that, like, like that black light stuff is, is just kind of nostalgic. Beauty and the Beast live on stage, I'm like, okay, you're just out of style. Like that. Oh yeah, absolutely. Well, and it's 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 hard to find a lot of production value to appreciate in Beauty and the Beast live on stage, yeah. relative to the Little Mermaid show, which at least has you know the puppetry and the black lighting and the enormous Ursula who comes out and the in theater water effects. Yeah, it's got a lot going on. Good stuff. Okay, so that was one thirteen p.m. Then of course at one forty five p.m. you give yourself some time for shopping on Hollywood and Sunset Boulevard. Flex time, character greetings, catching up. And then at 2.05 p.m., you exit the park and head to Epcot. Epcot. Nice. Okay, why don't you continue? All right, so we enter the park. By the way, it's now 2 p.m. in the afternoon. You've done two theme parks. (laughs) 
<laughs> yeah, we are entering a third theme park at 2.18 p.m. And not only have we gone to two parks, I think we've we've really hit the highlights at those two parks. Do uh, you happen to, to remember – I'm just wondering uh, – when you were entering these parks, how close were you to these times? 2.18. How close to 2.18 p.m. were you when you entered Epcot? Do you happen to remember? You know, I couldn't tell you exactly. I'm sure we weren't hitting these right on the beat. But I do recall that it was not until our time in Epcot that we started to fall significantly behind on the day. So during Animal Kingdom and Hollywood Studios, I do believe we hit all the attractions scheduled at least fairly close to their scheduled time. All right. I like it. So continue. All right, so 2.23 p.m., we're grabbing a fast pass for Soren. Uh, and this was, you know, early days for Soren, peak popularity. Uh, so that's why there's the note, grab a fast pass if any are available. I couldn't tell you if they were, I don't recall. Uh, but once we've got that fast pass in hand, uh, headed over to Spaceship Earth, which I think that was a great strategy for Epcot, uh, to hit up Spaceship Earth right after grabbing your first fast pass for the morning uh, because you you want to experience spaceship earth as your introduction to epcot it's usually my first thing but i like you said it's smart at least back in the day when you had to run to go get a fast pass mm-hmm. to go get one first then head back yeah 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 cool so with spaceship earth out of the way at 250 we were riding test track uh but if long lines meant that only fast pass is an option, and of course you wouldn't have been able to grab a fast pass because we had one for Soren at the time. Then we would just have to skip test track and do mission space instead. I am pleased to report that did not happen. We were able to ride test track Good. because nobody's trying to ride mission space. There we go. Perfect. I love it. Oh, I love that this is a stop. 3.10 p.m. Club Cool is on the stop. Very quick walkthrough according to the note, but uh, there also should have been a side note that said, must try the Beverly. <laughs> I'm sure we did try the Beverly because you're right. You have to, as awful as it is, you've got to try it. Uh, yeah, this, so I have on here that it's club cool. So this must have been after the sort of modern Coca-Cola renovation that we have now. Mm-hmm. Um, but this could not have been too long after they got rid of the igloo. Do you remember the igloo? I do not. No. So prior to it being called club cool, it was ice station cool. Oh, okay. Still a Coca-Cola exhibit, still where you would go in and get the Beverly, but you entered through a show scene that was an igloo that protruded, most inappropriately, I have to say in retrospect, uh, an igloo that protruded into Future World, and you would walk through the igloo, and it was really, really cold when you walked through, and, and there was a, he wasn't an animatronic, he was just like a, a large figurine of a man who was like frozen in the igloo, and then you would enter into the Coke store. Interesting. No, I don't remember that at all. Uh, of course, you give yourself three minutes from entering Club Cool until you get to Soren. <laughs> you got to drink that Beverly on the go. Yeah. And then 340 Mission Space, use Fast Pass only if necessary. Yeah, I don't think we ended up writing it at all. Good. That's fine. Yeah. If, if there's one attraction to blow up at Walt Disney World, that's the one. It's- yeah, I went back on it because of the new version. You know, they, they redid both orange and green. I went on once to experience those, and I'm good for another 10 years. Yeah, that attraction was one that was more of a can we do it as opposed to will it be fun, in my opinion, yeah, anyway. Yeah, that's a great way of putting it, yeah. Uh, okay, then you head to World Showcase, which, of course, is a very important stop if you're going to Walt Disney World and Epcot. Oh, 4.01 p.m., you gave yourself the favor of 21 minutes after Mission Space. <laughs> For a long a, walk. Walk by Mexico Pavilion, head straight to Norway. 4.06 p.m., priority Maelstrom. I love that. Another heartbreaking moment. Yeah. I didn't Maelstrom. have the emotional attachment that so many did with that one. But, yes, I, I, I do get it. Um, 4.06. All right. Cool. I am I am shocked that school bread is not built into the schedule here. And refresh my memory, Jeff. Have you tried school bread? I did yet? the last time I yeah, was there. Okay. It's quite delicious. Okay, I'm glad. I'm glad we brought you on board because I know desserts aren't always your thing. Yeah. I mean, I have a – yeah, they're, they're not a priority, I would say. But yeah, yeah. school bread was good. And I also, because of our friend Derek, tried the uh, birthday bread pudding over at Saratoga. Yes, yes. Holy moly, good stuff. Right? Yeah. Yeah, listeners, if you are over at Walt Disney World, Saratoga Springs might not normally be something that you would go out of your way to visit, but – It's worth it for that dessert. Yes, it's good. Okay, continue. So, uh, yeah, after Maelstrom, uh, 
we just have a little bit of built-in flex time. <laughs> have until 4.16. Oh, no, there's not much flex time here at all, actually. I guess it's Maelstrom and turn around and leave because we had to be back in Future World at 4.16 p.m. That's 10 minutes after <laughs> getting in line for Maelstrom. But recall, in the days before FastPass Plus, Maelstrom was almost always a walk-on. Mm-hmm. Uh, then that changed a little bit after they inter- instituted FastPass Plus. Those standby lines started to build up. But yeah, back then you could you could just zoom right in uh, to to Maelstrom. So that's what we did. And then headed back to Future World and exited Epcot uh, to head to Magic Kingdom. Now, I will tell you, Jeff, this has us exiting Magic Kingdom around 4.21 p.m. Exiting Epcot, yeah. Or sorry, yeah, exiting Epcot. Uh, I distinctly remember the sun starting to set when we were leaving Epcot. Okay. Uh, So we must have fallen behind an hour or two. Sorry, less shopping time for you. (laughs) Yeah, probably Test Track was to blame for that. Okay. So then at 4.36, you arrive at the TTC and board the monorail so that at 4.46 p.m. you can enter Magic Kingdom. So was it dark by the time you got to Magic Kingdom? Yeah, I want to say at least starting to get dark. Yeah, not too long after entering, the sun was gone. Okay, so then you enter Main Street USA at 4.49 p.m., take in Main Street USA and Cinderella Castle. Ooh, ooh, mistake here. It says Cinderella's Castle. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, that that schedule that I... (laughs) It's so bad. And the schedule that I tweeted out that you mentioned earlier, which was even older, that was from 2003. Jeff, it is riddled with inaccuracies and misspellings. I referred to the enchanted tiki birds oh, as an no. attraction. The enchanted tiki birds. Oh no. Who was I? Uh, I not I the same man you are today. We live no. and we learn, right? We, we when, live and we learn. When you know better, you do better. <laughs> That's right. Okay. So, uh, Cinderella Castle. Uh, walk, not run, up Main Street, but don't <laughs> shop yet. Veer left at second path. Four. I don't know why it says walk, not run. Like we were a bunch of runners. I don't know why that's in there. <laughs> I love it. So that uh, at 4.58 p.m. you could be in Adventureland to do the Jungle Cruise. Fast pass only if necessary. Nice. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And Jungle, Jungle Cruise is another attraction that for a long time, other than during peak hours of the day, the standby lines were almost non-existent. It was very easy to walk onto that ride. Again, Fast Pass Plus has changed a lot of this. Okay. Why don't you continue? 513, Pirates of the Caribbean, if open. I want to say that it was open. I think we got to write it. Uh, you know, that's that's one that goes down for, for refurb quite often. Yeah. I love how you uh, gave yourself 15 minutes from Jungle Cruise to Pirates, which are pretty darn close to each other, and both not necessarily huge lines necessarily. And like earlier in the day, you gave yourself three minutes for certain things. But 15, <laughs> 15 minutes between Jungle Cruise and Pirates. All right. Well, Jungle Cruise is a pretty lengthy attraction. I guess that's true. It's probably what, six minutes or so. Yeah, you know, like a roller coaster is over in two minutes. Fair enough. Yeah. Jungle Cruise is a is a long, leisurely ride. All right. Well, then at five twenty six p.m., you get your Adventureland flex time, which I, I'm guessing you probably didn't have much of at this point. Yeah, yeah. I think we were we were pushing through pretty hard at this point. Okay. Continue. Yeah. Uh, so we grabbed a fast pass at five thirty. We're in Frontierland. Grabbed a fast pass for Splash Mountain, uh, with the note that we should ride right away if the lines were manageable. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then grabbed dinner at Pecos Bill's Cafe. Uh, again, college budget. We were strictly quick service restaurants on these trips. Fair enough. Uh, yeah. Uh, and then at six oh one p.m., Big Thunder Mountain <laughs> Railroad. <laughs> So, lightning speed dinner. Uh, Yeah, Big Thunder Mountain Railroad, 601. uh, And (laughs) this seems seems unrealistic. 11 minutes later, at 612, we're riding Splash Mountain uh, with a fast pass. Yeah, when the fast pass comes up. Yep. All righty. And then 6... So, that that gave us 11 minutes to get through the Big Thunder queue, ride it, and get back to Splash. I dare say that did not unfold as planned. I'm going to assume probably not. Yeah. Then at 6.21 p.m., Frontierland flex time once again probably didn't happen. So, of course, you got to head straight to Liberty Square, where at 6.27 p.m., you're heading to the Haunted Mansion, which is, um, mansion. of course, a must-do, right? Oh, always. Yeah. Can you imagine? Can you imagine traveling any significant distance to the Magic Kingdom, uh, or Disneyland for that matter, and not experiencing the Haunted Mansion? Well, for about three weeks in uh, August and September, many people imagined it at Disneyland as they get ready for Haunted Mansion Hall. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true. Every year. 
Anyway, uh, 6.45 p.m., Liberty Square flex time. You probably didn't have much time for that. Mm -mm. Because at 6.54 p.m., you had to be at, at Fantasyland for Peter Pan's flight. Yeah, and this is interesting to me. I don't have specific memories of it, but Peter Pan's flight, even in those days, had monstrous standby lines, yeah. uh, particularly this time in the evening. And I don't have a fast pass noted on here. I can't remember whether we wrote it, and I can't imagine that we could have gotten on with this little time. I have, I have a 10 minute window for Peter Pan's flight. That There's no way that could have happened. Okay. So then at 7 04 p.m., you had to, It's a Small World. You gave yourself quite a bit of time between It's a Small World, because I guess that is a lengthy attraction, because at 7.26 p.m., you wanted to be at Mickey's Magic. Yeah, Small World's lengthy, and as 20-year-old Aaron would have loved to have pointed out to you, the boats move at different speeds, uh, depending on the crowd levels, and you have to account for that slower travel time. You're such a nerd. Oh, my God. <laughs> Unbelievable. I love it. Uh, why don't you continue? Uh, yeah, 726, Mickey's Philhar Magic, just enough time to get in, see the show, uh, which is a pretty finite amount of time. And then at 8.02 p.m., another heartbreak moment. Oh, this one really hits hard. This is pretty devastating. Oh, I forgot course, for a second. You guys don't have this anymore. Yeah. We don't have it anymore. You still do, so it's probably not as sad for you. And that's Snow White's Scary Adventures. Rest in mm. peace. Now uh, a Rest in princess peace. meet and greet, right? Yeah. What a poor use of that space. I mean, I love that we have Seven Dwarfs Mind Train. Yeah. But, you know, Seven Dwarfs Mine Train could have been a Sleeping Beauty roller coaster, and we could have kept Snow White Scary Adventures. Yeah. And that would have been the better approach. Okay, now, this is an interesting choice. 8.27 p.m., walk into Pooh's Playful Spot. Is there a reason why that was a specific need for you guys? All I can think of is that this was new or had been moved. Because do you recall there was a period of time where that was moving around? They, they were working on, like, a meet-and-greet space, and then they were doing the new queue. Yeah. For the mini adventures of Winnie the Pooh. So that must be why that was on there, is that we just wanted to see it in its new location or, or whatever was going on with it at the time. Okay. And then at 8.28 p.m., you, you have some flex time, and you walk into, wrongfully typed again, Cinderella's <laughs> castle. Uh, for those of yeah. you listening who don't know what we're talking about, the official title is Cinderella Castle, not Cinderella's Castle. I remember, actually, I was at... At Disneyland, one of those days they were shooting for the, the Christmas uh, TV special, and we're out there waiting for, like, the concert to begin, and whoever it was, some, you know, TV personality was introducing the performer, and he kept saying, we're, we're, here, we're here at Disneyland in front of Sleeping Beauty's castle, and, like, a stage manager or producer or something kept coming over, Sleeping Beauty castle. Oh, all right. We're here at Sleeping Beauty's castle. No, it's wow. Sleeping Beauty castle. And, like, he wasn't getting what he was saying wrong it was really funny anyway yeah well I'm, I'm i'm saying wow sitting here judging him while we're reading my schedule that has <laughs> cinderella's type castle typed out multiple times yes uh, but yeah back in these days it was a lot easier to get into that castle and some spend some time walking around because they didn't do all the stage shows and everything as often and so that's one thing that i really miss was the freedom to most times of day be able to enter through the front of the castle and walk out the backside. yeah Cool. So then after that, you head to Toontown. So at 8.41 p.m., you're doing the Barnstormer at Goofy's Wiseacre Farms. Yeah, Barnstormer 1.0. Did it change? It, yeah, so now it's it's the Barnstormer featuring Goofy as the Great Goofini. But it's the same track. It's the same track, okay. but the the show scenes have changed. Okay. Uh, the, the backstory has changed, the theme. It's all incorporated now into Storybook Circus. Gotcha. Back then, it was part of Mickey's Toontown. Very cool. 8.45 p.m. Toontown Flex Time, which usually means shopping. And then you head to... Tomorrowland! And grab a Fast Pass for Space Mountain. Uh, and here again, this is similar to the approach to Epcot. You want to kick off Tomorrowland whenever possible, I think, with the Tomorrowland Transit Authority, mm -hmm. which back then did not have People Mover as part of its official title. By the way, the Fast Pass was 8.52 p.m. for Space Mountain, then 8.54 you're heading to the Mar Tomorrowland Transit Authority. Yeah, so two minutes to grab a ticket, uh, but they're right across from each other. Uh, oh, I like then, this yeah. little note you have for yourself. Go ahead. 9 o'clock p.m. Yeah, this is in reduced 9.5. Uh, first parade starts. Lines should be short. So is this the Main Street Electrical Parade? Uh, Spectra Magic. Oh, which oh, uh, put a I know. bullet through my chest. Oh, God. God. This is hard. This is kind of depressing to read through and remember. Uh, but yeah, as I recall, I think there were two 
showings of Spectro Magic that night. Oh. Uh, and so being the experienced park tours that we were, we knew that during the first showing, you want to be experiencing attractions so that you can take advantage of all the crowds that are out watching that first parade. And then you see the parade in the less crowded second showing. Okay. So while that parade's going on at 9.05 p.m., you're going to do Space Mountain. At 9.19 p.m., you're going to do Astro Orbiter. Interesting to have that on the list. At 9... Is that a must-do for you? It is not a must-do for me now by any means, but I do recall having an affinity for that at one point in time. So, yeah, that must have been during my Astro Orbiter kick. Okay. 9.31 p.m., Buzz Lightyear's Space Ranger Spin. And then 9.49 p.m., Rush to the Castle Hub and get as good a spot as possible for fireworks. Now, I'm surprised it said Rush and then not parentheses, do not run. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, walk, do not run. Uh, yeah, and again, trying to get a good spot uh, for the fireworks with 11 minutes to go before the fireworks. I don't know how successful we would have been, particularly given that we were running behind. But hey, you got to do what you got to do when you're trying to squeeze in four parks in one day. Uh, but yeah, definitely hard to get a great spot with 11 minutes to go. Okay, then after the fireworks at 10.20 p.m., you're going to do the Walt Disney World Railroad. So that at 11 p.m., Spectro Magic begins. It's a sketch spot for this earlier. So hopefully you got a spot. Do you happen to remember if you got to catch Spectro Magic? Oh, we definitely caught Spectro Magic. And I will tell you, I think this was our first time as a full group getting to see Spectro Magic. And that theme song became so special to our group of friends. I remember my college roommate would often just say, play it. Ah. Yeah. And I'd uh, John Debney, right? Is Yeah. Oh. Yeah, I, he, he did, I think, the the main cue for it, yeah. Unbelievable. Uh, I will say, I'm pretty sure we scrapped the railroad in part because you know, it's closed for a period of time before and after fireworks, okay. uh, which I probably didn't know at the time. But yeah, I don't think the railroad ended up happening. Okay, and then at 11.20 p.m., free time for the rest of the night, shop, ride, and re-ride. Try to do Jungle Cruise again because it's great at night. All right. You've got to do Jungle Cruise day and night. Okay. Different experience. Fair enough. And then at 12 a.m. midnight, the park closes. Main Street USA will still be open for some shopping and snacks. And then 12... Gotta get that ice cream. I like this note. Why don't you read this last note? 12.30 a.m., kiss goodnight. Let's hope. So what does that mean? So do you know... Are you familiar with the kiss goodnight? Well, for those who are listening... No. no, no, There there is a song. That was the 60th. Sorry. Right, there is a song. But the Kiss Goodnight is just a, a very simple, understated lighting package that happens on Cinderella Castle sometime after park closing. There's a swell of music. The music on Main Street gets a little louder. It's very orchestral. Uh, and then there's just a little announcement that says something to the effect of, we thank you for being part of our day here at the Magic Kingdom or, or something like that. Uh, it used to be for many, many years that the Kiss Goodnight was not so regularly scheduled. Now it happens almost every night, if not every night, and, and sometimes multiple times at night. So you're almost guaranteed to see it. But but years ago, you were lucky to catch the Kiss Goodnight. Okay. You didn't know when it would happen. And it was sort of uh, this holy grail in the Disney fandom. You can go back at message boards uh, from the late 90s, early 2000s, and you'll see people – you know, trying to get an inside tip for, do you know when the Kiss Goodnight is going to happen? Uh, because you wanted to be there. So it was, it was a very special thing. Uh, and now when it happens, I still stop and turn around and just kind of take it in because I remember how special it used to be. And you see all these guests just sort of ignoring it or people are confused by it. They're like, why did the music get so loud? Nothing's really happening. There's lights projected on the castle. Uh, but yeah, it was a very special thing and a great way to end the night. Do you happen to remember whether or not that happened for you guys? It did happen, and what I remember is waiting a very long time on Main Street. In fact, I think this might have been the time when we were literally the last people on Main Street with uh, Disney security ever so kindly and gently walking toward us and getting closer and closer with the implication that we should probably go, but eventually the kiss goodnight did happen. Nice. So uh, that's your schedule. Uh, Walt Disney World, all four parks in one day. Next mission should be all four parks plus the two water parks. See if you can make that happen. (laughs) But (laughs) the question is, was your mission successful? Listen, it was completely successful. Uh, Did we hit every single thing at the exact minute scheduled? No. And we knew going in that we wouldn't. But 
Not only did we get through almost every attraction that was scheduled, we did get through all four parks. We spent a significant amount of time in each of the four, saw all the highlights. We were crazy exhausted at the end of the day, but it was the kind of exhaustion that lends itself to giddy delirium. Mm -hmm. So what I remember more than anything is that everyone was just in such a great mood at the end of the night. I mean, it was that really sort of, this is where memories are made. This is where magic happens, kind of a feeling that people look for in a Disney park. And I think that if you ask, any of those people who went on this trip, they will tell you the schedule seemed a little intimidating beforehand, uh, but everyone was glad that we had sort of put the work in in advance so that we didn't really have to think about where we were going next when we were in the park. We already knew where we were going, and as a result, we were able to accomplish a whole lot and just enjoy our time with each other without having to say, all right, who wants to ride this? No, I want to ride that. No, we should go over here. All of that was alleviated in advance. I was going to ask, would you do this again? But I mean, the fact that you have multiple schedules like this makes, I mean, the answer is yes. You did it over and over again. Back then, yes. Now, obviously, as a local to Walt Disney World, I never do anything like this. When I go to Disneyland or a couple years ago, I, I did uh, Tokyo, Shanghai, and Hong Kong all in one trip. I thought about Not one that. day. Not all in one day. <laughs> not, not, no, not all in one day. That was like a two-week trip. I did think about dusting off these old schedules and kind of modeling after them to create an itinerary like this for the international parks especially. I didn't go quite this far, but there was sort of an intermediary schedule. Uh, for me, I've always been – it's been like the live show thing that has been on my schedule just because those are scheduled times. They're yes, not open all day yes. long. So for me, that always tends to be like as far as I would go. And I and I know which attractions I wanted to do and maybe plan like, hey, that one's going to be busy. Let's do it early. I never went to the lengths that you did with this. But I am curious. Do you kind of feel like these days – Disney kind of does that for you if you're taking advantage of my Disney experience or my Magic Plus. Uh, does it essentially do what you did years ago? I don't know. I, I honestly think it has kind of the opposite effect because here's the thing. With this schedule, as detailed and down to the minute as it was, we still had the flexibility to change anything on a whim. Uh, and we had the flexibility to say, you know what, let's grab a fast pass for this e-ticket instead of that e-ticket. And maybe not on this trip, but on some of the other trips, that happened a lot. We would say, you know what, I really want to ride Splash Mountain a second time. Let's go get another fast pass for it in, in the evening. And that kind of thing is very hard to pull off now, uh, where you've already selected your times, you know, a month or more in advance. You show up. Can you modify them? Yes, but if you're there with a large group of people, uh, the hopes of modifying or trading out a fast pass for a different e-ticket attraction on the day of, it's very hard to do. And so I think uh, you, instead of having the comfort of knowing we've got a fallback plan, but we also can change anything whenever we want, you now have the pressure of feeling we have a plan that we have to stick to and we can't really change. Yeah. Okay. Now, when would and when wouldn't you suggest something like this sort of schedule you've done? Well, I'd say it's a personality thing. Like, like I said, we were all game for it, and we all had sort of a, a you know, a, a good natured approach toward it, where no one was going to be heartbroken if this whole thing fell apart. But at least we had a plan to guide us, and it happened to work out. So, if if that sounds appealing to you, and you are someone who does not get to a Disney park very often, you're going maybe once a year, once every other year. You've got limited time, limited budget, and you've got the right personality for it. I would say, try it. You don't have to stick with it, but try it. Have, See if it makes your vacation better. Have you ever done it with family or just with friends? Yeah, I've done this with family. Wow. Uh, you got your whole family to go along with this? <laughs> yeah, everybody everybody said they thought it was great. They, they liked the idea of them not having to think about anything. And I'll tell you this, Jeff. We would often be following these schedules, and everyone would have their printout in hand. And we would walk by families who were standing in the middle of, you know, Tomorrowland with a map, like upside down, trying to figure out where they were, where are we going next, bickering. We would notice that so often because by contrast, we were in contrast, we weren't having to do any of that. It was already all planned out in advance. So it's, it's not the sort of insane headache um, pressure feeling that you might think it would be. So how much time did it actually take you to organize this? More than it needed to because I love doing it so much. I, I would find reasons to revise it. I mean, I got really into this thing. 
<laughs> but like, it's fun. It's fun to completely obsess over your vacation. I would argue that it's an essential part of any vacation experience is obsessing about it beforehand. And you don't have to obsess about it this way, right? You don't have to plan out a schedule minute by minute. It can be watching vacation videos, watching YouTube videos, listening to podcasts, reading books about the park. It can be anything, but just really indulging yourself in the excitement. That's a big part of what makes the trip memorable after the fact. I honestly think it's the best part. Like I, very yeah. often the the lead up to it is, is, better than the actual thing i find so yeah so this is one of many means to the same end which is essentially making a big deal out of your vacation because it is a big deal and the bigger deal the bigger a deal you make of it the more you'll take out of it okay so you mentioned slightly uh, a bit earlier but just in case there are any more sources where did you do your research as to the best times to do attractions and such yeah, I know in the early days, uh, the unofficial guide was a big part of it. Uh, all years, of course. Uh, these days, I would say easywww.com has some of the best trip planning advice. I don't think he, his website was around back then, but, uh, really great up to the minute fast pass plus, uh, touring strategies on there. Uh, there's a guy named, uh, I think Steve Shores, uh, who runs a, a site that basically publishes the times guides for each park and updates them weekly. So, you know, when showtimes are and all of that. Uh, and then the hassle free guide to Walt Disney world by Steve Barrett also has a lot of really accurate run times for attractions in it. Okay. Well, I am impressed by this and I find it hilarious. And as I said, <laughs> I wouldn't do this. I, I mean, I guess if you were to do all the work, maybe I'd go along with it, but I feel like I'd just be way too opinionated to be like, I don't know, you didn't fit what in there? But, I mean, you did a pretty good job hitting the heavy hitters here. So, um, anything else you want to add to this before we head into some trivia? Uh, no, I would just say this was a blast to go back. I feel like I'm visiting uh, an old version of myself who's a completely different person, but who I still I mean, you keep saying you're a completely fondly. different person, but let's face it, you still spend many, 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 many hours researching Disney stuff. Now you just write it as a book and make money doing it as opposed to, <laughs> as opposed to uh, doing it for your own enjoyment in a park. So I, I don't yeah, know if you've changed that much. Well, like I said, it's a, it's a different means to the same end. It's still about appreciating and savoring the parks. Now it's just less about do 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 go 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 and more about well what's happening here why are why are we responding to these things and why are we loving them and, and sort of stopping to smell the roses but it's all ultimately about connecting with the place excellent cool well i think that means it's trivia time all right aaron do you want to hit me with the trivia question first or shall i hit you Oh, gosh. Uh, you know what? I'm always terrible at answering these, so let's get that out of the way first. Jeff, you hit me. Okay. Well, you went to Walt Disney World during the happiest celebration on Earth, and you said it was. Uh, it started in 2005. You went in early 2006. And, of course, that was celebrating Disneyland's 50th anniversary around the world. So I want to know, what was the official song of this celebration, and who sang it? Oh, that would be the one and only Remember When by the one and only Leanne Rhines. Ding, ding, ding. Love that song. It is a good song. It is good. It's a really good song. I guess theme park songs go, uh, it's really great. It's awesome that they got somebody of her talent and um, I guess fame level uh, to come in and do it for them. And it's such a nostalgia trip too. If For anybody, I think, who went to the parks during that time, uh, yeah, that takes you right back there because they played it after the fireworks. And yeah, yeah, it's good. Do you prefer that one or a kiss goodnight? I love Ashley Brown. I will say that at the outset. I love Ashley Brown, and I'm so glad that she recorded a song for them. But I do think that Remember When is the better song. What do you think? Um, I would probably go with A Kiss Goodnight because okay. of the uh, – I, I love that it goes back to Walt and, yeah, and calling yeah. it A Kiss Goodnight. I just think – I mean, I, I love Ashley Brown. I think she's yes. spectacular. So And, and Richard it's a Sherman, Sherman song. So. Yeah, yeah. So, I'm with you. But it's a tough choice. Remember one is fantastic as well. Anywho, what's your trivia question for me? You got it right, by the way. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay. So the official premiere of Fast Pass, which we talked a lot about in this episode, Ooh. at Walt Disney World was in July of 1999. Okay. And it included just three Fast Pass eligible attractions. In the entire resort? In the entire resort on 
So this is day one. There were some tests that were just called a virtual queuing experience prior to this, but the first official day of FastPass. Okay. Uh, there are three attractions. I'm going to say Space Mountain. Is that right? Wrong. Wrong? Wrong. Wrong. Oh, my goodness. Big Thunder Mountain Railroad? Wrong. What attractions are there? Splash Mountain? Wrong. Are they Are they all in different parks? They are all in the same park. They're all in the same park. Okay. Uh, I was going to say tell me which park, but that would probably give it away. I'm going to... Is it Disney MGM Studios? No. So this is 1999. 99. Disney's Animal Kingdom? Disney's Animal Kingdom. Okay. Hot off the presses. So it was brand new. So um, Kilimanjaro Safaris. Yes. Dinosaur. Then known as Countdown to Countdown Extinction. Countdown to Extinction. And... Cali River Rapids? Yeah, that's right. Okay. You got them. Uh, so yeah, that was mid-July. I couldn't find the exact date, but mid-July, this is according to the Orlando Sentinel. And then a couple of weeks later, Space Mountain and Splash Mountain were added in Magic Kingdom. And then Rock and Roller Coaster made its grand debut on July 29th with Fast Pass at Disney MGM Studios. Fantastic. Well, Aaron, thank you for doing this trip down memory lane with me. Thank you for letting me make a little bit of fun of, at, at you. I, I It's... It really makes me laugh a tremendous amount. So thank you. There's no one I would rather come on and laugh at myself uh, with than you, Jeff. Thank you. So thank you for tweeting that. Um, That was amazing to me. Folks, you can follow along with Aaron over at AaronWallaceOnline.com. Is that correct? That's right. And, of course, get his books, The Thinking Fan's Guide to Walt Disney World Magic Kingdom, Epcot, and Hocus Pocus in Focus. Anything else you would like to plug here? Uh, yeah, that's it. Uh, all you need is my name. Follow me on Twitter, Aaron Wallace. And yeah, I'm around. Awesome. Thanks a bunch for coming on. This was a lot of fun. Thanks, Jeff. And before we get going, I want to let you all know that over on Patreon, I actually recorded an audio commentary of Phantasmic 2.0, where you can watch along on a video on YouTube and pop in your headphones to hear my commentary on it. I have a lot of opinions about Phantasmic 2.0, so if you want to check that out, head to patreon.com slash DCTC. It's also a new month, which means that there is a new music playlist out there. If you're not getting those, make sure you sign up over at DisneyCoastToCoast.com and click on the playlist tab there. Other than that, folks have a magical day bye thanks for watching disney coast to coast have a magical day <laughs> disney coast to coast is produced and hosted by jeff DePauli. learn more about the podcast and become a supporter at disneycoasttocoast.com